My name is Miles Berry. I'm Senior Lecturer in ICT at the School of Education in Roehampton University. Right, well, good morning. Welcome back. Here we are with lecture number eight of our Programming for Primary Teachers course. Today's lecture is about social constructivism um, and other educational theories, looking at those, just drawing connections between those theories, also looking at how those theories link to ICT education, link to how teachers teach using ICT and teach about ICT, but also drawing in some ideas of software development itself, so exploring ways in which software can be socially constructed as a knowledge artifact. Software. I'm thinking about you know, the way we learn things together as a group, the way you learn things from other people, and, and drawing parallels there with the way software gets written through a group of people working together on a shared project. The students today are first year undergraduates on Roehampton's teacher training program. They're training to be primary school teachers. Uh, the group today have all chosen ICT as their subject specialism. So we'll start off with a little bit of introduction to education theory, cover you know, ideas about constructivism, social constructivism, one or two other modern educational theories, then move on to some work on open source software and taking those sort of open source shared creation of content ideas and applying that to other media too, such as photographs, such as text. And then chance for us to look at how Scratch projects get developed as part of a community Community. We'll get onto the computers and have a look at the, the Scratch website and some of the development that's happening on there. And then time at the end for you to get on with your own project, getting feedback from one another. The first section is a very quick tour through a number of educational theories, sort of early 20th century through to the present day. I want to start by thinking about, you know, examples you've had you've experienced of where you've been learning about ICT, where you've been learning using computers as part of a group um, alongside other people. Anybody like to kick us off with that, either at school or at time here? Yeah. Uh, we've been creating our own animations in groups. As part of the other half of the course, the multimedia aspect. So t tell us about how that's, what that experience has been like. Well, it's quite good um, working as part of a team because you can all take different roles and as you know everyone can have their own job and work together to you know form a project. Do you really. find yourself learning how to use the software from other people talking about how they're getting how they're doing things? Yes because I find it easier to do or take part in the creative side of the um, animation like making yeah. the puppets um, and some other people taking the role of using the software. Excellent example. What about in your school days? Does anybody recall doing group work in ICT when you were back at school? No. So maybe just like presentations and things, or just working as a group to like display like uh, over a, I don't know, like a specific author or a specific uh, book. Mm. And then, yeah, just sort of working in say two or threes on like, a presentation software. And just everyone chipping in and helping out to did you find that you were learning how to use the software better? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, that yeah. Experience. Definitely, you know, that sort of discussion yes. is, is key, especially with learning. Certainly um, a point which we're going to return yeah, to. Yeah, definitely. It's really good. So, uh, what about Facebook? Any of you got Facebook accounts? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Give me some examples of things you've talked about to do with stuff on the course via Facebook. Yeah, keep every, all the other group up to date, making sure they know what's happening and what's going on. And Anyone needs to bring anything in or okay. any resources. So sort of practical stuff. Yeah, definitely. Other examples, anyone? Yeah. Um, we discuss our assignments in groups. So if we have a problem with one of our assignments, then we'll all discuss it and we can learn from each other. Of course, I imagine that's quite a broad group of people that you're sharing <laughs> experiences with. That's really good. What about Moodle that we're using to, to support this course? Have folks found that helpful? Especially like the reading, if you um, read it or didn't understand a point, someone else could, you know, write in a bit of about, you know, quotes or just specific ideas that yes. you maybe haven't read all the text or whatever. And it's just good to sort of see other peer other people's views and what they think. So. And it's been great. I think it's been great seeing some of the the things that you've found, your own discoveries being posted up into the Moodle forums. So I hope you've all got some experience of of using technology to learn in a social way and learning about ICT is with a recognition of that being a social process. Okay, I want to touch on, the, the focus is really about that social learning, but it doesn't really make sense to talk about social constructivism with at least starting with some idea about what constructivism is. And I suppose we have two heroes of constructivist learning. And the first, I guess, is Dewey, and this huge emphasis that he placed on learning through experience, and that one starts 
education, with all of the experience that children have had of their environment. But of course, our role as teachers is about extending that experience and providing more and deeper and richer experiences for children so that all of them can learn through those sort of hands-on, direct experience of things out in the real world. Um, Dewey also placed a huge emphasis on interaction, on the importance of having a rich environment through which children could, through which learners would interact and have those experiences. And again, Dewey and the, the emphasis on reflection. And it's not just enough to have those experiences, but it's stepping back from the experiences and thinking about those things and how that forms one's understanding of the world. And Dewey was a great Democrat as well with this notion of entitlement and that it's education for all. Now, I hope that doesn't come across as radical stuff. But think back to how things were, late 19th century, early 20th century, and how different a model, about, a model like that would have been from what had gone before. And what about in ICT terms? Well, you've got this going on always with the computer. Yeah? We don't teach ICT as a theoretical subject. You know, we get on and have a go with the computer. We're immediately learning through experience. And I'm sure that's the sort of experience you'd want your children to have, to be exposed to, that they're going on and doing something with the computer. They're forming their understanding of how computers work, of their understanding of a bit of software through experiencing that software for themselves. And I think even today, we see lots of Dewey's ideas when you come to you know, ideas like project-based learning of rather than, you know, here's a set of instructions, here's a, you know, a small directed task, but you know, working together, working on a more open-ended project which allows you to, to experience things for yourself. Yeah? And of course, Piaget, you know, coming at it from a psychological point of view, that actually learning is about creating, constructing a model of how the world works. It isn't simply about knowing facts, it's about producing that mental schema, was the word he used, about how the world around you works, about an understanding of knowledge, about that, that being something which each child constructs for themselves. And he identifies a couple of processes there. You have this idea of assimilation, you have this idea of accommodation. The child has their mental model and into that they're bringing in all of these new sensory experiences, all of the new things they try and fitting that in to their existing mental model. And, this, and then of course once in a while you know, that the sensory data, the experiences don't fit with the mental model. So having to change that mental, mental model to accommodate those new ideas. I think if one were to criticise Piaget, it would be his sort of fairly definite notion that there are fixed stages of development. And I don't think we think of children sort of working step by step now in quite the same way that Piaget perhaps did. He also talks a lot about, certainly upper end of primary stage schooling, about the need for the concrete operational, for children to learn through moving things around, through building things, through experiencing you know, direct physical objects and using those as tools to think about ideas, to build up those mental models. I wonder today if actually for children it's that, that the distinction between the real world and the virtual on-screen world is perhaps not as, as stark as it might once have been. And children build, building things with, with objects on screen, children manipulating objects on screen is for them just as concrete, just as operational a process as it would have been for the children Piaget was working with, building things with blocks and building things. You see that in Scratch, don't you? The sort of Lego-style metaphor of putting the blocks together. I'm sure that's something which Piaget would have been delighted to see if you were around today. Day. Um, yeah, again, with, in terms of ICT, you're forming your own mental model of how a computer program works. Children, as they're learning to use a bit of software, are forming their mental model of how a bit of software functions. As they try things out, as they experiment with it, they're building up their mental schema of how that software works. Yeah? Um, moving on now to, to the notion of social constructivism, that Piaget uh, was very much focused on the development of each individual child, building up their own mental model of how the world works. But I think we've come to recognize that actually Actually, it's not simply through the experience, through the experiment, through the resources, but it's through the conversations that take place around those things that so much of our understanding of the world gets built up. So we have this notion of children learning 
through other people, through the conversations they have with other people. Mondlisi on her Moodle post, a brilliant summary of Vygotsky on there. And she identifies um, three things um, from Vygotsky's work. And I think they're exactly the things that I'd mention myself. Firstly, the importance of this social interaction that it isn't enough in your classrooms just to have all of these rich experiences, all of these wonderful activities. If you're not also making time, making space for children to talk about what they've learned, think back to you know, Dewey and the importance of reflection. Well, that reflection surely is something which works really well when you're talking to one another about those things. Uh, Vygotsky also recognises the place of the, the more knowledgeable other that, that the child's learning is something which is brought on by somebody who's a little bit further, or a long way further, along that learning journey, who can tell them, you know, help them to make that next step along the learning journey. And you also, of course, will have heard of this idea of the zone of proximal development, that what the child can do, what a learner can do when working with other people is much more significant. And of course, their progress, step by step, through those things which they can learn when working alongside other teachers. Bruner extends this idea with the place of scaffolding, that actually you know, it's the role of the teacher to provide you know, a framework in which that construction of meaning can occur. But once the meaning's made, you can take the scaffolding away. Um, so what about this in IT terms? Well, if you want to find something out yourself, how do, you, how do I do this? You might ask a friend. You know, you have still got the chance to talk to other people about this stuff. But also, you know, you've got Google. You've got the whole of that sort of collected knowledge. And, of course, that's a socially constructed thing. The Internet isn't just machines. You know, people have put the content in there in the first place. I wonder, you know, we talked about adaptive learning design and ways of doing e-learning. Whether you get, could ever get to the point where the computer is the thing which is taking that child on to the next stage in your learning. Okay, in terms of IT, then, you have Papert, who's, you know, the, the godfather, the, the, the great hero for educational ICT, who takes the idea of constructivism, social constructivism, and turns it and, and explores it from a slightly different perspective. He uses the term constructionism. That it's not simply about making meaning out of the world, making your own mental schema. That's important, of course, that's what learning is about. But Papert is saying that sort of learning, that making meaning out of the world, is something which happens best when you're actually engaged in making something. You're involving yourself in using concrete materials or virtually concrete materials and building what he would describe as a knowledge artifact or a, a, a public entity, something which comes to embody your understanding of meaning, your understanding of the world, or your groups, your friends, you know, the people you're working with. You're building that as a thing together. You're building that for other people to comment on, to critique, to provide you with ideas as you make that better and better and better yourself. But we move away from just dealing with abstract ideas to actually making something. He has this lovely example of, of walking in and, and seeing an art class going on and the children in there being so excited about making sculptures out of soap and how each of these sculptures is different and each of these sculptures embodies in some sense that child's worldview, that child's understanding of the world around them and wishing that maths teaching could be like that, that that sort of creativity is something which you'd see in other subjects too, that it's not simply about you know, the art and design side of things. So do you have examples of either from your own time at school or here or when you've been in school, children doing creative things with computers? Well, just the other day when I was at work, um, they had to design props that were going to go in a castle on the computer. So some were drawing like thrones and chairs and they were just experimenting with all the different colours and techniques that they could use. That sort of provisionality, being able to experiment. Um, another sort of modern theory here, we have this notion of connectivism. So is George Seaman, Stephen Downs, and trying to think of a, a learning theory which makes allowance for, takes into account the digital world, the, the access we have now to all of this information, to all of these other people via the internet. You know, the social construction of meaning isn't, is no longer just the other children in your class. It's all of the other people that you can connect to via technology as well. And so Downs and Siemens say that at its heart, learning is about making connections. 
And they say those connections are all, there's all sorts of connections going on when you're learning something at a very reductionist level. You know, it's the stuff that's happening in your brain. But we also have, and I hope you come to recognize this yourselves, this notion of the connection between one idea and another. And you see how one topic, one idea, one concept links to another. Um, and of course, those ideas, those connections that you make are because of the connections with other people, yeah? And coming together face to face and talking about things together, sharing ideas with one another, sharing ideas via the internet. The connections aren't simply between concepts, aren't simply between neurons, they're also between one person and another. So it's a lovely way of bringing together so many different educational theories of connecting together lots of ways of thinking about learning. I think it's a very powerful way of thinking about it. I hope this rings true for you, that, that this is Etienne Wenger and the notion of the community of practice. And this is something which you yourselves are engaging in at the moment as you are becoming teachers. And this is very much the process of teacher training in here. You have all of this learning that you're doing these three years. And at the moment, a lot of that is about learning as experience, about making meaning, about understanding you know, mental models, the socially constructed ideas about education, ideas about learning. But you've also got you know, an emphasis on practice too. Your block school experience, going in and doing the work of a teacher, learning how to be a teacher through that direct experience. But whilst this is the stuff that it's easy for us to focus on at Roehampton's level, this stuff is so important to the other two circles here that you're becoming part of the community of teachers. Yeah? Your Facebook example is such a good example of that, of learning from one another. Yeah? Has anybody here signed up for the TES forums? Okay. Again, you know, that national community of teachers that you're participating in, yeah? that you're becoming part of this sort of culture, this society, this community, but also you know, this sense of taking on an identity of not just doing the work of a teacher, or it's about being a teacher, yeah? And part of what's going on through this course is that sort of change in who you are as you become a teacher rather than simply learn about teaching and, and, and do the work of a teacher. There are other communities you're part of too, other communities of practice. And you, as a part of that community of teachers, you've also got you know, the ICT teacher community. And you know, that's a, lot, a lot of that is technologically mediated. And as IT specialists, that's going to be something which is going to be quite important. Um, and of course, the technology has changed this. If you think back to how it would have been in my day, you know, it was the community of practice that I was part of was you know, my PGC co cohort and then the first staff that I joined. And it was a very clear, very identified group, and I learned a lot through those people. Because now, but now, you've got this sort of flattening of the world. You've got these connections globally as well as nationally. And so that sense of being part of a community, it's a worldwide thing. And you know, Chris Anderson and the long tail idea, you have these niche communities. And we'll see that later on, you know, the Scratch community of practice. You have exactly the same things going on in the Scratch website as children, as others are learning to use Scratch as a programming language. They're participating not just in learning through experience and learning through doing this stuff, but they're also being part of a community that they feel an attachment to. And I hope you'll get some sense of that as we look through the Scratch website in a little while's time. The second part of the lecture is looking at open source software as a model of software development where a community engaged together in producing a software artifacts so and bringing in ideas of the social construction of knowledge and applying that to a software project. Has anybody heard of open source already? Good. Give me an example of what you've heard of, Matt, please. Um, Moodle's one of them, or stuff like Audacity, things like that. So what makes open source different from other software? Um, well, it's free, and anyone can access it from the internet. Excellent. And you don't have to have a license for it, or, or the license is free that comes with it. 
Yeah, you're licensed to use it. You're also licensed to adapt it. I'll come back to that. So what do we mean by open source? Well, not this approach to software. We've got, you know, convenient software. You turn up at the, the shop or you get the stuff from the internet. It's there in a box. You take out the contents, put it into the machine, and it's there. It's up and running. It does what you expect it to do. Yeah, it's convenient software. It's not that different from sort of convenience food. You know, you get the package off the shelf, or these days you can order it via the internet, put it into the appropriate machine, and there it's ready. You've got a hearty, nutritious meal ready prepared for you. Yeah, it takes all of the work out of that cooking business. It's so easy, isn't it? Yeah? It takes all of the work out of that programming business. It's such an easy thing to do. There's a difference, though, isn't there, between, you know, the convenience food, the food off the shelf, and actually reading through the recipe, getting the ingredients together, maybe adapting that recipe, changing it so it, you know, it's closer to your taste or closer to your family's taste, yeah? And you've got access not just to the ingredients, you've got the meal, the, the finished product at the end, but you also have the instructions for how to do that yourself. And, you know, okay, it's not going to be as fast some of the time, it's not going to be as easy some of the time, but it's kind of more fun, isn't it? Or it can be more fun. And of course, you can go further than just following recipes in books, which is about my limit, to sort of writing the recipes yourself. And, you know, starting from, no pun intended here, scratch, and, you know, writing what you want to produce, what you want to cook yourself, okay? Working with what we would term in computing terms, the source code. This is the source code. This, the recipe books have the source code in them. It's the instructions to make the finished product. And that's what open source software is about. It's you've got access not only to the finished product, but you also have the instructions for how to build that yourself. And you've got the freedom that that brings you. We talk about, uh, Matt said it was free software. And you're absolutely right. Open source is identified as free software. In English, we have the problem that the word free can mean two things. Yeah. It could mean free beer, and nobody's going to say that's a bad thing, yeah? that you don't have to pay for the stuff. But it's also about freedom. And open source software, is, the idea is one about it being freedom, free as in free speech, as much as it is free as in free beer. And so the ability, to, the software that brings you a number of freedoms, and the, the definition, you know, the published definition says there are four freedoms. And they say freedom zero is the freedom to run the program, that you can do that without any restrictions. You can do whatever you want with the software itself, download it from the net, and run the stuff. This is how Scratch works. This is how Moodle works. Yeah, we don't have to pay for a license for either of these things. We're free. We're allowed to install that on all of our computers. We can, do, we can just run it for free. And again, that's quite an appealing offer for schools that might be working to relatively tight budgets, that you can do new things, things you wouldn't otherwise have been able to do because that software's not got any budgetary impact. You're also free to study how the program works. You know, Moodle is an example of that. If you want to, you can look at all of the instructions that make Moodle do what it does. You can, if you're really interested, get the source code for Scratch and see how Scratch has been put together. Not particularly interesting for most of us, but somebody last week was saying how useful it was with the Scratch scripts themselves. Was it yourself? Yeah how nice it was to be able to get onto the Scratch website and see how other people had done things. I mean, it's because these Scratch scripts, Scratch projects, are published on the website as open source with access to that source code that you can learn from what other people have done with Scratch and borrow that, those ideas very freely and incorporate those into your own program. You're also, of course, free to redistribute the program. And again, that's quite a plus for a school. You can put a link to it on your website. You can burn a CD-ROM of the thing. You can put the stuff on a USB stick and give all the children the same program to use at home as they've been using at school. You also, you also, of course, have the chance to improve the program, to make it better, to make it fit more closely to what you want to do as a school, what you want to do as a teacher. And okay, that does require a certain bit of technical expertise, but at least you've got the option to do that. So, you know, I'm self-confessed enthusiast for the open source. But I hope you can see how it links closely to some of this educational theory, yeah? 
It is the social construction of knowledge. As an open source community come to understand how to build software together, what they want the software to do. So for me, it's about embodying those educational ideas in approach to software. Um, we got Audacity as an example. You've got you know, Open Office, which is another office suite. You know, it will do word processing, it will do spreadsheets, it will do presentations for you. And of course, that's free. You can distribute it to all of the children so they can use that tool in school and at home. And then you have other things which run on sort of servers and will provide websites and will provide, um, you've got image editing software, you've got whole operating systems. So if you don't want to use you know, Windows as your standard operating system, there are free and adaptable operating systems which a school could use or which you could use. Not many people sort of gone down that route, but using these free programs, open source programs on Windows, relatively common these days even in education so taking the idea of open source of being able to have that freedom to change things to learn how it was made to adapt it yourself you can apply that outside of just software coding it doesn't have to just be software that you think of in open source terms so now there's this thing called creative commons um, so what you've got there is the person who's created a bit of you know, work, you know, there's, there's creativity gone into that. It could be text, it could be graphics, images, it could be video, it could be anything where there's you know, creative work involved. They are saying, rather than you know, all rights reserved, if you want to do anything with this, you've got to ask my permission or pay me a fee for this. They're saying, OK, you're welcome to use this in these ways. As long as you keep to these conditions, you can use this without having to ask my permission. Um, you're seeing this more and more on the net. So Flickr, for instance, will let you search just through the Creative Commons licensed content, for instance. Uh, Wikipedia. Are there any differences between Wikipedia and any other encyclopedia? Can't you edit it by yourself? You can change the information that's on there. So technically, it may not always be right, because anyone can edit it. Absolutely. You click on the Edit tab, and you can change the content of that page. And, you know, first time I show Wikipedia to a class of children, I'd immediately, you know, find a page that they, we know about, click on the edit tab and make a change to that. And they think, my golly, if Mr. Berry can change it, anybody could change it. And we've often, I often put in, you know, something silly. And by the end of the lesson, the Wikipedia community will have come back and corrected my, my, my deliberate change and sent me a message saying, we know you're just testing it, we've spotted it, please don't do this again. Which children are hugely impressed by when that happens. But you, you, know, you have this idea of it's, it's an encyclopedia which has been created by a whole group of people, not just by somebody who's the expert, the authority on that. So yeah, you have to take your chances there. Is it actually reliable? In theory, you've got enough eyes, enough people looking at the thing you know, have some degree of assurance that most of the time it's going to be about right. But it brings that question to your mind about, can I trust this? And that's one of the real pluses of using Wikipedia in schools, I'm sure, that it makes children question, is this reliable information, rather than just assuming everything on the internet, it must be right, because, well, it's on the internet. Yeah? And Scratch itself has this recognition of Creative Commons. As you'll see in the community site, when you upload your projects to Scratch, you are agreeing that it's shared on a Creative Commons, um, what is it, attribution share alike license. They have this example of it's like sharing cake at a party, but as well as sharing the cake, you're also telling people the recipe for the cake so they can go home and bake a cake like that themselves or take your idea for what made a really nice cake and improve on that. Again, you know, it's this, this recipe metaphor and being able to learn from others' work. So there are a number of Creative Commons licenses and basically you choose the one for your work that you feel comfortable with or if you're using somebody else's Creative Commons license content, then you make sure that you're sort of picking stuff which is appropriate for the context in which you're using it. So, you know, most of the time you have to say who the picture is by. So, you know, like academic fair use and the, the fact that you're quote, always quoting your sources in an essay when you're using Creative Commons content, you're saying who created it. So if you do use other people's ideas from their Scratch projects in your Scratch projects, you know, fair dues, say where you got the idea from.
Yeah? You also often will find a sort of share-alike condition, that if you've used Creative Commons content, then you let other people use the work that you've built on from that. And so you're participating again in that community. You're building up that shared knowledge artifact there. Um, some people license their content for non-commercial use, so if you try, want to make money out of it, you've got to go back and ask for permission about, about that. Some people want to put in a non-derivative clause, so their work retains its integrity, and yes, it's free for other people to use their work, but they can't adapt their work without seeking permission from the originating author. The next thing then, how are we doing? I want you to go and have a look at what the Scratch community is like. But all of you, please register on the Scratch site, because once you register on the site, you're allowed to download the source code. You're also allowed to comment on the work that's on there. Okay, so set up an account. Then have a look at some of the work which children have uploaded to Scratch, yeah? Imagine yourself three years' time, two years' time? <laughs> three years' time, working with a class of children on Scratch. Possibly it's an after-school club, possibly it's your, you know, your year six group post-SATs. Yeah? And they've produced their scratch projects. Have a look at the sort of thing which children in primary schools are producing. And I think some of the stuff really very inspiring. What I'd like you to do, ideally working with a partner, is provide some feedback on that. Imagine, you know, this is a project that's been handed in to you. What sort of feedback would you give to a child who created that work? Try and be positive. Try and be encouraging. If you can suggest, you know, future development, how to move it on, that would be great too, okay? So do that inside the Scratch website, ideally working as a pair on that. If you've got time, we'll see how we go. Have a look in the Scratch forums, see what the discussions are. There's also a Scratch Ed website, which is a community of educators who are using Scratch. If you're really, really brave, then feel free to upload the project you've been working on onto the Scratch website and see what other people in this worldwide community have got to say about your work rather than just relying on one another's feedback and my feedback to that. You don't have to do that today, but it would be a nice thing to work towards, don't you think? Okay. Have a look at what's in there. As I say, if you can, do work with your partner and provide some feedback on that. The next section of the lecture is an opportunity for the students to engage with the Scratch online community. So I'd like them to register for accounts. I'd like them to have a look at some of the work which pupils, particularly in UK primary schools, have uploaded onto Scratch. So they've got a feel of the sort of work which they were using Scratch in schools themselves as part, teaching part of that control technology syllabus. They, they might see from their pupils in a couple of years' time. And have it, I'd also like them to have the opportunity to provide feedback on that work to the users who have uh, uploaded their project to the site. I'm hoping that at least one or two of my students will be brave enough to upload the work that they've been working on as part of this course onto the Scratch site and receive feedback from a much wider community than just their friends on the course and me as their lecturer. We could do the word plants as sprite, yeah? And a bit of blue background. But that would be one way of doing it. Yeah. This is a, uh, a year five slash six sort of game in a food chain sort of idea. And obviously you're the black bird and you can control it with the mouse. You've got to eat all the ladybirds. In a specific time, with the sparrowhawk, if you land on the sparrowhawk that appears anywhere, obviously you lose your life and you have to start again. Um, do try and provide some feedback to one or two of these projects that you've had a look at. But if you've not done so already, you really ought to be moving on to your own game project now. Use this as a chance to get feedback from the other people here, okay? Try and work as a partner, critique one another's games, yeah? Suggest ideas, and then you'll, have, you'll be able to show that you've sort of further developed what you've done. Oh, me. Uh, okay. It will um, change colours and then move it to the whole next level, so I broadcast it in. So you can see here, when I receive the background one, it will switch to the background here and then it's got the script and then like on your... How do you get the background? The pot displaying the number, which is tricky yeah. but doable, have the pot saying the number. So if it's like four and three and this is seven, they have to drag the plus in. I can't for the life of me work out how to do it. 
Okay, so you're going to have randomly appearing on the buckets the right numbers, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And then you've got to choose the right symbol make to make the sum correct. Yeah. And it will say, yeah, well done or something. Yeah. Okay. If answer equals case, then get the cat saying, yay. <laughs> Go to look. My niece has uploaded a tennis game. Let me see if I can find it. Click on the green flag. And I think it's the arrow keys to move. <laughs> so what did you think of the work you've been looking at? What did you think of pupils' work uploaded to Scratch? Any comments? Pretty impressive, really. I mean, considering some of the age, ages on there, like, yeah, I'm 10 and uh, just done such and such project, and they're like, can you help me do one thing? And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, just asked pretty good. Other comments? It's quite hard. There's some very advanced stuff. Yeah. I'm wondering whether Scratch is one of those things where for maybe one or two or three or four or five or six children in the class, it really captures their imagination. They go and create their account on the Scratch website. They start creating really complex programs themselves. I'm thinking back to a boy I was teaching last year in school who, you know, we had our programming club. They came in and they, they learned how to use Scratch. But it really gripped his attention, his imagination. And he ended up sort of submitting 30, 40 projects all up to the Scratch website, all incredibly gruesome things which was slightly disturbing for me as his teacher, but there you go. But his enthusiasm has been so captured by that. It's not going to happen for every child, you know, but perhaps for some it will. And I think you know, there, is the, there is that difference there between you know, the formal, let's work on these things, let's, you know, here's a project, I'd like you to go and do something using Scratch or work towards this particular idea. And then the informal stuff where children take that idea and run with it in their own time and be aware of that distinction. Anybody, was, was there anybody who was disappointed with the work that they saw? Some of them didn't do anything and you're like sitting there going, what, what is it supposed to do? Yeah. I think one of the lessons is put the instruction screen on and it's lovely to see that in several of your games that you are actually putting that you know, instruction screen on at the beginning or there's that lovely sort of movie introducing to the game where you explain how to, how to do the game. So I think if one's going to upload stuff onto the Scratch website making it clear how the game works is probably good advice. Hopefully you've got some really useful feedback from one another today about how to take your game forward. And remember that there are marks in the assessment for improving on the snapshots. So thank you very much to those who uploaded snapshots last week or uploaded those today. There's an additional 10 marks for making improvements and for you, your documenting that process of I tested it or I invited my friend to have a look at it. If you've got you know, a child of the target age range who you could have a, let have a look at the game, getting feedback from children on what your game's like and what they find easy, what they find confusing about it would be a really good thing to have. And you could, of course, get that through the Scratch website. A couple of follow-up activities. Have a look at the rest of this open source software that's out there, okay? There's loads and loads available for Windows. Some of it's really, really good. You, those of you who've been using Firefox today, Firefox is an open source web browser. Um, and, you know, it's certainly the thing which I'm using much more than I'm using Internet Explorer or Safari these days. But if you just type in open source education software or open source software for Windows, or for your, you know, if you're using a Mac, have a look at what's available on the Mac. If you see something you like, do post some comments into the discussion forum. You know, if you think about other things you might have used and, and comment on those too. Um, there's also a reading from a book Future lab produced sort of three years ago now about open source software in education but also taking the open source idea and applying that to education so the sort of thing I was talking about with Creative Commons with Wikipedia with this notion of let's all contribute ideas let's build on the ideas of others uh, future lab produced a, a book um, as i say three years ago now which was exploring that so <laughs> please have a look at at least the introductory chapter to that do read more if you've got time to i'm hoping that it will give them a sense of synthesis of education theory of bits of software development and understanding of, of aspects of computer science and of course their own work in producing resources so they'll see that those as parts of a multifaceted 
faceted whole, making those connections between education and theory, between the programming work that they, they're doing, and also you know, that wider context in which programming and educational ICT takes place.